Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Richard Louvre, a journalist and author of eight books about the connections between family, nature, and community. Louvre's best-selling book, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, has stimulated an international conversation about the relationship between children and nature. Louvre is the chairman and co-founder of the Children and Nature Network, an organization helping build the movement to connect children to the natural world. Louvre was awarded the 2008 Audubon Medal by the National Audubon Society and has served as an ad advisor to the Ford Foundation's Leadership for a Changing World Awar Award program, as well as to the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child. Louvre gave a talk titled, Beyond Nature Deficit Disorder, The Restorative Power of the Natural World, on March 7, 2011. He was the Oregon Humanities Center 2010-11 Robert D. Clark Lecturer in the Humanities. His talk was part of the Center's year-long sustenance series. Rich, welcome to UO Today. Thank you. We're very pleased to have you. Our sustenance um, series is about midway through, and we just wouldn't have wanted to do it without you. So oh. we're really <laughs> pleased you're willing to come to Thank Eugene. You. I wanted to start off with something that I'm, uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with as a, as a guest on many shows like this one. What were your own experiences in nature as a boy that got you started on this whole path? Well, I grew up at the edge of Kansas City. Uh, first in Missouri and then on the other side of the border later in Kansas. Uh, I could go out my uh, kind of suburban tract house back door through the yard, through a hedge, into a cornfield uh, where my underground fort was. And, that's, uh, and then from there on into the, the woods and the fields and the farms that seemed to go on forever. I spent much of my boyhood in those woods. I owned those woods. They were my woods, and uh, as an eight-year-old, they were. <clears throat> I had such a sense of ownership of those woods that I think I pulled out hundreds of survey stakes that I knew had something to do with the bulldozers that were taking out other woods. And I think I held them off for a while. In fact, a developer told me a few years ago it would have been a lot more effective if I just moved the stakes around. Okay. I gather that that is a, a story that resonates deeply with people from our generation. I mm -hmm. read an article that you wrote recently in an online publication called Juxtaprose, and you described how a gentleman stood up and told you that he had yeah. done the same thing. But yeah. it's also a deeply emotional and nostalgic feeling for us now in comparison with what today's children are doing. What has changed so radically? Well, without going into the statistics, the, 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 the reality of childhood today is that it's mainly indoors. Uh, the, the amount of time that kids spend outside running around, making forts, uh, any kind of independent play outside the house has dramatically uh, fallen. Um, while the time spent uh, in front of video games <coughs> and computers and indoors has, has risen. Uh, independent play is disappearing along with uh, just kind of the normal exposure to nature. Uh, <clears throat> this is not, I think, uh, an, an exercise in nostalgia to think about this. Uh, for all of human history and prehistory, uh, human children went outside and spent most of their developing years either playing or working in nature. And within the matter of about three decades, we're seeing the potential virtual disappearance of that if we're not careful. You make the point that um, it's what you call the biophilia hypothesis, that, that humans are innately attracted to nature. Is that one of the reasons you have some optimism about this, being able to reverse this trend? Well, I do. <coughs> um, the, the biophilia hypothesis is E.O. Wilson's uh, hypothesis at, uh, at Harvard. Um, Neil Wilson is one of the great scientists of our time. Several decades ago, he began to talk about this, and the idea being that we are hardwired as a species to be attracted to nature, and in fact, to need nature. There are uh, uh, many studies of this. One of them uh, tested what kind of images human beings are attracted to all over the world, in all kinds of con all the continents and all kinds of cultures, urban, rural. And what they found is that human beings, of all the images that we have the choice of being attracted to, are attracted to images of nature. And of those, 
landscapes, and of the landscapes, the one we are most attracted to is the savanna. So as a species, where did we come from? Uh, that doesn't prove that, that uh, we have a direct link to the savanna psychologically or some kind of genetic memory, but it suggests that there's something deep within us uh, that, uh, that goes on and on and needs nature. Even when we haven't had it when we were kids, we can rediscover it. You make the point in that same article that when adults get together and talk about their memories of being out in nature as children, that various barriers and cultural divides yeah. fall. Is that part of the same phenomenon? I, I think it is. I mean, I think this speaks to uh, how, how deeply this is felt. Uh, the reaction to the book was a lot more than I thought it would be. And um, I didn't really know when I was writing it how, how primal this is for people how deeply it, it strikes. <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was surprised at some of the response, particularly from some of the response of political folks on political extremes, including the, the religious right. I expected a lot of grief from some circles who might uh, feel that I was trying to get their kids to worship nature. And that's a that, that is a, a deeply uh, worrisome thing to some people. I don't agree with it, but I respect that worry. Uh, uh, and actually one of the first champions of Last Child in the Woods was the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, with whom probably he and I wouldn't agree on very many things politically. But I, the, CN, uh, the uh, Christian Broadcasting Network had me on the Pat Robertson show, The 700 Club. Uh, it, they did a great job on the on the topic. And I was puzzled by that. I was puzzled by a number of religious uh, leaders of different kinds who were drawn to this issue. I came to the conclusion that um, smart religious people of whatever kind uh, all kind of intuitively understand that all of spiritual life begins with a sense of, sense of wonder. Now, what is one of the first windows into wonder? If we're lucky, you know, we have that experience early in life of crawling through the, the grass in the backyard and finding a rock, turning it over and seeing for the first time that we're not alone in the universe, and hearing wind and trees for the first time. Uh, this speaks to us in deep, deep ways, that sense of wonder and awe. And, you know, I'm not anti-tech specifically. But I, I, I have trouble imagining that many kids get a sense of awe and wonder playing Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Indeed, that's a great question. And I'm sure you've talked to your own sons about this. They're now young men. In fact, they got me to play Grand Theft Auto. I, there you I, go. I did some empirical <laughs> research. And I, I got out of control and I tried to kill everybody in sight, including the good people run over them. So, so I, <clears throat> I, I know this issue intimately. <laughs> well, so you could be praised for checking out the other side <laughs> yeah. of the argument. You said that um, you have not had the backlash that you thought you might. Also, that the response to this book has been bigger than you had anticipated. In fact, it seems to be enormous. The book came out in yeah. 2005. It's been translated into nine languages. It's been pub published in 13 countries. It's really become an international um, movement, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's now up to 10 languages in 15 countries. 10 languages yeah. in 15 countries. I'll correct my notes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to get a t-shirt that says, who knew? Uh, uh, I really didn't. I, I didn't expect that kind. And uh, again, this, uh, I think, has to do not so much with how well the book is written. And you know, um, uh, some days I think it was really well written, and then I pick it up and think I could have done that better. I don't think it has to do as much with that as it does with this primal uh, feeling that people have and that actually people didn't have much of a language to describe the disappearance of nature from their lives and their, particularly their children's lives. And I think the phrase nature deficit disorder, even though I kind of resisted having it on the cover, the publisher insisted that I resist it, shows you how much I know about marketing. Um, the, the, the phrase, even though it's a little tongue in cheek, and I'm very careful to say this is not a known medical uh, condition. Maybe it should be uh, uh, considered that. Uh, but that phrase gave people a, a name for what they were feeling and sensing was happening around them. 
It struck me reading the book and then listening to you talk about it on other interviews that it, one of the reasons for its success may well be how many deep currents of worry it taps into at the moment. There's issues of child raising, there's issues of child health, both um, social and physical. There is um, ecological sustenance and sustainability. You've managed to bring together um, some of the biggest anxieties that we're feeling right now. Is that was that deliberate? Were you trying to be interdisciplinary in hooking these various phenomena together? Uh, yes. Um, and, you know, journalists, in a way, are the last generalists. Uh, the studies done by uh, people in, in, in academia tend to be fairly narrow, as they, as they have to be uh, in many ways. But uh, to see the, the patterns among those disciplines is, uh, unfortunately, journalism is its involvement in, in, in seeing the big picture seems to be receding. Um, but I, I'd like to think that the book was not only about anxiety on these issues. It was really not a depressing book. I think or people have told me that. It, it really, in a way, is a hopeful book because too often we identify the anxieties without identifying the antidote. And I, I believe that uh, today the, the more high tech our lives become, the more nature we need. Nature is the antidote to much of what we're feeling. One of the things that definitely makes it a hopeful book is that delightful section of 101 Things You Can Do to help turn this around. And there's things as simple as put an old scrap board down and leave it there and pick it up and see what's underneath after a few days and then yeah. after a week. I love the fact that it had a kind of a, a very easy how-to manual at the back. Yeah. I'm assuming that's also very deliberate. Well, it was. That was added in the second edition, the, yeah. the new edition that's out. Um, it's not only for parents and kids, that, that section. It's also for communities. So it, it, uh, it is also about what whole communities can do. Uh, it's about what educators can do, about what uh, architects and, and urban planners can do. Um, we can't just ask parents to do this. Uh, uh, this is something that we need to look at institutional change, political change. Uh, ultimately, it's about the way we view nature, though, as individuals. In early interviews, when you were um, when you were speaking about the book shortly after it was published, you were using definitely tongue-in-cheek the phrase "no child left inside." Yeah. But then there was the "No Child Left Inside" Act of 2009. Mm -hmm. It was introduced in Congress on Earth Day, 2009. What happened to that bill? Uh, the bill passed in the in the uh, uh, about three years ago passed in the in the House and then it stalled in the Senate. It was incorporated into some other other legislation. There's a new bill out right now that picks that up again. I can't remember the name of it. Um, uh, I, I was supportive of that. And in fact, as you say, it was a little tongue in cheek. I found early on I found that the the the, the one guaranteed applause line was when I said if we really want education reform will have an, uh, a No Child Left Inside Act. And um, uh, people like that because they're so frustrated with the No Child Left Behind approach to education, which increasingly is test-oriented. And, and, you know, I mean, schools have been canceling recess, uh, uh, canceling field trips, uh, you know, giving kids more and more Ritalin. Uh, I'm not uh, a radical in Ritalin. Some kids, kids need medication. But people also need to know that they're are studies that now show that just a little bit of contact with nature re reduces the symptoms of attention deficit disorder dramatically. Um, these studies are done at the University of Illinois and some other places, which raises the question when you've got some classrooms where 30 percent of the boys, some schools, 30 percent of the boys are on Ritalin, what proportion of those kids that are being given those stimulants, and again some kids need them, but what proportion of that huge increase might have something to do with the fact that we took nature away from kids in the first place? Or the number of antidepressants being prescribed to children? Or the rate of suicide rate, uh, suicide rate among uh, teenagers? Uh, could that have something to do with the fact that we've so radically changed childhood in such a short period of time? So paradoxically, at the same time as we've taken nature away from children or children out of nature, you make the point that children today are much better educated on questions of sustainability, on environmentalism, on um, the destruction of the rainforest. How did we get to that 
disjunction between those two things? Um, because we increasingly thought of nature as something separate from us, fundamentally separate from us, something that was out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, kids can tell you anything about the Amazon rainforest now, but they can, they're hard pressed, many of them, to tell you about the last time they just went out in the, in the woods and watched the clouds move in the leaves. Um, I couldn't have told you anything about the Amazon rainforest when I was a kid, but I knew where the snakes were. You have also, um, you point out a really interesting correlation between the rise of organized sports and the rise in child obesity. Yeah. Those two seem contradictory on the surface. Yeah. How does that connection work? Well, um, often we, we, we look for the magic bullets. And, you know, one can make the case that nature is, I'm perhaps presenting nature as a experience as a magic bullet, but I don't see it in isolation of other things. In organized sports, I'm not against organized sports, but the greatest increase in child obesity in our history occurred during the same two decades as the greatest increase in organized sports for children in our history. Uh, however good it may be for kids, it's not do doing the trick in terms of uh, their health. Uh, what that has replaced is independent play, which has everything to do with the development of creativity, the development of executive function, which is the ability to control yourself, it has everything to do with, I think, happiness and joy and feeling that you're someone in the world and that you belong to the world and the world belongs to you. Uh, we've replaced that by regimentation with activities that are under adult control, whether it's direct adult control or whether it's a program sitting in, programmer sitting in Silicon Valley who, who is controlling in, indirectly. Again, you know, I'm not against high tech at all. I, I love my iPhone. But w how far do we want to go down that, uh, that road? I got a call today from the Salt Lake City newspaper. There's a new study out, from, I think it's University of Utah, that talks about the, 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 the video games where you jump and dance and, and move, and which I think are a good thing, uh, saying that that works better, apparently, than walking three miles per hour for kids. And I think that the way that study was done is very interesting. I, I don't know very many kids that walk three miles per hour. I mean, even Harry Truman on his constitutional in the morning probably walked 3.5 miles an hour. But that's not the way kids are outside. You know, they, they run in spurts. They build things. If, they're, if they have this experience, they're burning off calories in, in, in multiple ways. And um, so some of these studies are very curious. We have understudied the benefits of nature for human beings. It's barely been scratched. Meanwhile, we're, 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 we're talk, some scientists are talking about the post-biological era, you know, that, that, that we don't need somehow physical experience in nature anymore. Uh, you know, when we have only scratched the surface of whether we're children or adults, what the natural world does for us. I'd love to turn from that book about which of course we could speak for hours and ask you to tell us a little bit about the new one which is just about to come out it'll be in bookstores in April you said yep. with an official re release date of May yep. would you talk about this one it sounds as though you have invested heart and soul in hmm. in, in this new work um, when I was uh, uh, early on when I was out there talking about last child in the woods often and this still happens uh, someone in the audience would stand up an adult and say what about us in fact, one woman in Seattle when I spoke there grabbed me, grabbed me literally by the lapels when I was signing books. She just says, listen to me, adults have nature deficit disorder too. So this book is more about adults, but it's, it asks some, I think, deeper questions about this society, and it actually imagines a society. You know, I asked this question, what would it be like to, to live in a society in which we are as immersed in nature experience every day as we are in technology every day, where we live, work, play, learn, um, and uh, you know our daily lives. What would that be like? When you look at some of the emerging studies, which are fairly new, most of them are correlative, not causal studies. But you know, when you do look at that body of knowledge, which is emerging fairly recently, you find that this is the nature experience, whether it's indirect or direct, whether it's in our environment, our neighborhood or whether we're consciously doing things in nature, helps our, 
our mental health, it helps our physical health, uh, it, uh, it f makes us feel more fully alive. Um, other than maybe a New York subway, when else do we use all of our senses at the same time as we do in the natural world? Much of modern life is all about narrowing our senses, narrowing it to a cathode ray tube or a flat panel screen. And uh, th that's not who we are. That's not the species that we are. Um, so we have to, uh, I think, think about what we are uh, losing and what we could gain by having nature be more a part of our lives. And this is everything from uh, how we view the regions that we're in, in terms of what is valuable, how we view social capital. There's a concept in the book that I introduced called uh, uh, human nature, social capital. Robert Putnam talks about, uh, you know, bowling alone in his book, Bowling Alone, talks about social capital. It's a, it's a phrase that's often used by urban planners and others um, about the need to build social capital. Well, why do we think we're the only species in our lives? You know, the, the, the possum that comes through my backyard, the lizards I can see from my desk out there that entertain me, that make me laugh, uh, they are part of my, my social capital. Whether, I, whether they, you know, they don't know it, or maybe they do in some way, but they are part of who I am. That, they are part of what makes a culture, a city, a, a neighborhood healthy and fun and happy. Uh, cities like Portland are doing a lot to bring nature into the city to recognize that as a value that we, we need to encourage. Um, but it also affects how we learn, uh, how our minds work. Um, I, I'm not saying that we need to do away from, away with technology at all. In fact, I, I met a, uh, a guy who teaches uh, people how to pilot cruise ships. And uh, he said that he gets two kinds of students learning how to be captains or pilots of cruise ships. One is uh, the kind who grew up only with electronics, and they're great in the, in the control room. They're great with all the electronics. The other kind of uh, student he gets is someone who grew up playing outdoors, much more experienced in nature. Uh, and he says they actually know where the ship is. They have a much, much deeper kind of spatial sense of where they are in the universe. He said we don't need one or the other, we need both. We need young people who have both of those abilities I, in, in the nature principle, which is the name of the book. I, I call that the hybrid mind. So uh, this is not so much a, 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 an exercise in nostalgia or wanting to go backwards. It's actually wanting to go forwards to what I call in the book the high performance person, uh, the high performance restorative city, the restorative home, the restorative neighborhood, the restorative workplace, the restorative business in which we bring these ideas, immerse ourselves in nature, in our, the way we design buildings, the way we have everyday life, uh, uh, and that that actually can make us feel more alive and help our psychological and physical health and our ability to learn and, and see big pictures. You just introduced the prime principal title of the book, The Nature Principle, and the subtitle is Human Restoration and the End of Nature Deficit Disorder. So it sounds as though this book is a pretty good and pretty close follow-on from the preceding one. It did, does, yeah. this, did this one grow directly out of the other? Yeah, it did. It did. You said it was harder to write. Why is that? Um, I thought about that for a while <laughs> after I uh, finished it finally. Uh, and I think that the last child was about one big idea. And I repeated that idea quite a bit uh, through the book. And, um, and I gave different aspects of it, basically about one. I think that the nature principle is about seven big ideas that have a cumulative effect, uh, I hope. Uh, it, it, it's also really taking the risk of speculating big time on the, on the future. It's also taking the risk of actually being optimistic about the future. It may not turn out that way, but that's, that's what it's meant to do. Well, you, call, you, you used the adjective hopeful with regard to the earlier book, and this one is, makes it sound as though we have only to take the leap and we are there and we have healed this particular breach in, in our attachment to nature. Well, it's a huge leap. and. Um, uh, 
you know, we used to have books in thinking that imagined a, a good future. Somewhere along the line, we became addicted to despair, and the only future we've seen for a while is the dystopic fi uh, future. I'm not saying that the future I describe in this book will absolutely come true. But, you know, I don't think we have any practical alternative to hope. We have to start painting a picture of a world we'll want to go to. That's what Martin Luther King said in many ways, which is any movement, any culture will fail if it cannot paint a picture of a world we want to go to. And that's what we need to be doing, it seems to me. One of the things that I'm most looking forward to in this book is that I feel as though it's going to give me and a lot of other people permission to do what we have to, <coughs> excuse me, what we have to uh, apologize for now, which is spend the day gardening or go off and ski or hike in the woods for yeah. a day. So really, uh, I think you're preaching to the converted out here in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> have you met with areas of the country where you've had a particularly receptive audience? Well, the Northwest is, is very receptive. Uh, every part of the country, I've now gone to every state, I figured out the other day, because the last child in the woods, I've spoken everywhere. And, and now increasingly, I'm, I, I speak overseas in uh, the UK and recently in Copenhagen. Australia now has started a bunch of, of mm -hmm. campaigns. There's over, in, in the United States, by the way, there's over 40 uh, regional campaigns that have emerged. Uh, uh, I'm the chairman of the Children Nature Network, uh, which which kind of tracks these regional campaigns. A lot is going on in Oregon. Uh, um, you know, Beth Stein with the Youth and Nature Coalition here regionally is doing great work. A lot of great work being done. Um, uh, but every part of the country and now elsewhere in the world, I think this is resonating with. And it's not so much needing permission. I, I do hear from parents who feel affirmed. You know, they felt shamed sometimes by other parents because they actually let their kids go outdoors. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I, I, I think that um, institutionally we're going to see a lot of change. You're already uh, seeing pediatricians, for instance, individually change. I was asked to give the keynote to the um, American Academy of Pediatrics National Conference a few months ago. That's fairly significant. If we can begin to make that kind of institutional change, not only for kids but for adults too, I think we'll all be a little healthier. On that note, I'm going to have to stop you, but with regret. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. We've been speaking with Richard Louvre, a journalist and author of Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. He's the chairman and co-founder of the Children in Nature Network, an organization helping build the movement to connect children to the natural world. Louvre gave a talk titled Beyond Nature Deficit Disorder, The Restorative Power of the Natural World, on March 7, 2011. He was the Oregon Humanities Center 2010-11 Robert D. Clark Lecturer in the Humanities. Thank you for watching.